All right, let's talk about the fun stuff. Let's talk about the advanced concepts that we're going to cover that you're not going to find anywhere else. So we're going to talk overall about how to complete a versatile muscle workflow that can radically speed up your projects in both VFX, games, and any other type of projects that you might come across. We're going to talk about automating pre-roll. And this is a huge thing. Ever since the, the start of character effects, you've, we've needed to, you know, have pre-roll for shots. You know, what if you have a shot that starts mid motion, somebody's like punching somebody and the shot starts midway through their punch. Well, the first couple of frames are going to look inaccurate unless you have that pre-roll. And so there's kind of a long discussion about um, or debate about who is responsible for this pre-roll. You know, the CFX artists don't want to do it because they feel like it's an, an, an animation job. Uh, the animators can do it, but it's hard to understand how long things should be. If you have pre-hold, if you have, you know, ramp up, if you, if you need to dilute some of the locomotion because it's too strong and too powerful, too fast over a, a large distance. So we're going to talk about how to completely automate this. And I know that might sound like a holy grail to CFX, but, um, you know, we, we're going to talk about how you can automate this pre-roll, adjust it and edit it purely as the CFX artist in a mathematical sense to where, uh, none of the animation is, um, you know, it, 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 it won't have to rely on our artist, artistic ability. We can just rely on our technical, um, crafts, craftsmanship. Okay. So, uh, like I said, with automating the pre-roll, we're going we're gonna to talk about automating, increasing, decreasing locomotion and limb momentum. So what this means is that let's say, um, like for example, uh, I, I used to work on a, a couple of different Marvel movies and um, it's, it's, it's only muscly people in tight fitting clothing. So like there's lots of muscles going on. There's lots of jiggle going on, lots of CFX. And, you know, these characters, like if you look at one of the Superman movies, um, or, you know, if you imagine like if you were trying to simulate like something like Dragon Ball Z or something, these characters are moving an extremely fast rate, an inhuman, in physical, unnatural uh, rate, because, you know, they just need to almost teleport sometimes to get to places. Um, and you know, they are also traversing such a large distance or they're so incredibly large, so incredibly small, you know, think of something like Ant-Man and, and he, he need his simulation needs to look different, whether how big he is, how small he is, um, how fast he's moving, how far he's moving, you know, like when he goes really small and jumps around very quickly. And, you know, we need to be able to control this stuff. And so sometimes uh, we need to dilute the locomotion. So we need to slow down um, or decrease the amount of movement the character is uh, doing. And then we need to simulate it at that movement. So imagine it instead of uh, moving 10, 10 feet, they only moved one foot. And then what we need to do after we simulate that at one foot is we need to re-inject that momentum uh, inversely from how we slowed it down. Now, then we have limb actual per limb momentum. And so what that is, is that if somebody's punching or if somebody's running and it starts on that frame, it, it's going to look incorrect when, you know, uh, frame one, it's going to look incorrect for like the first couple of frames because uh, it's, it's just not going to have that right momentum. So we're going to talk about actually choosing the start frame and then looking at the animation for all the limbs and then inversing that mathematically. Uh, so we don't have to rely on animation to actually, you know, do that. We can just literally take their animation and inverse a duration of it. And um, we're going to talk about all the blending, all the pre-holding, all that stuff. Uh, so, you know, we're not going to have to have a physical artist, physical person do this. We can control all of this just from the uh, simulation standpoint, which is going to be great. Okay, so one of the most amazing things about Houdini is the fact that's like it's it, it's an it's an operating system. It is so versatile within its application and outside of its application. And one of the coolest things that it has are top networks. 
So top network stand, uh, uh, top is a task operator. So a lot of things we're gonna talk about in Houdini's, you'll notice that it's, it's some letter and then it's OP. So SOPs, ROPs, you know, CHOPs, all these things are operators. So TOPS, task operator, SOP, surface operator, um, you know, you've got CHOPs, channel operator, uh, ROPs, render operator. So um, we're, we're gonna look at how TOPS can delegate all of our simulation in a sequential manner, but also with parallel evaluation based on how many cores we have on our local machine. And then we're going to look at how to, you know, log that, how to export it, how to do sequential simulations um, and batch simulations. Uh, and then, you know, on, in, in addition to you know our, our our top operators, we're going to look at how to wedge out these simulations. So wedging is essentially when you know, let's say that you have you have Hulk, and you're like, I want when Hulk's arm flexes, I want his bicep to increase. Um, well, I don't know if I want it to increase. 1.25 the volume um you know when it when it contracts or do i want to increase two uh two times the volume when it contracts and what i'm gonna have to do is i'm gonna have to do two simulations where i set those two you know variables each time and i'm gonna have to have a, a human person do that or i'm gonna have to have set up two scenes and then you know sent uh then on two different computers and um you know, hit go. And that's just gonna, it's, it's not like it's impossible, but it's, it's, it's a little annoying to delegate that or do that by hand. So, um, or, you know, wait for it, you know, if you only have one machine. So wedging simulations allows you to set up any number of variable, um, changes. So if you want it, if you want to do a simulation where the bicep increased 1.25, 2.0 and 5.0, um, then you could set that up, hit go, and it's going to run all three of those simulations um, in, in a parallel manner, uh, depending on your computer resources, or you, know, you can send that out via deadline um, and, and to a farm job. And then when you come back, you're going to have those three variants and you can review those um, as opposed to, you know, only seeing one and then after you see one realizing oh we need to try another one we need to try another one so so this is great if you have the computer resources and you know something's just sitting idle why not try a variety of wedged attributes and pick the one that you like the best you know the simulation is all about a race against the clock when it comes down to it we're not at the whim of the of the artist and the amount of time or how fast an artist can do something we are still at um we're still under the control of the computation power you know it's not real time we're like we're getting closer there with unreal but we still have to wait uh, for these things to simulate. So we need to be very, um, very sure in our planning and take advantage of any amount of time during the day or more importantly, the night and more importantly, uh, the computing power that we might have on hand to perform as much simulation as possible uh, in the most efficient man manner. Okay, so we talked briefly before about data logging and notification. Uh, we're going to talk about in you know in the top network how to um, log out to a file, how to do a more extensive log, as well as how to send an email um, once certain tasks are done, uh, so that you know you can notify group, um, and so you don't just have to be coming back to the computer checking it out now and then. You can just set up automatic notifications, which is fantastic. And you know again. It's one of those things where you're like, Houdini has a node for that. It's, it's like, it's it's true. It's just like, they've, they've really kind of taken these high level concepts in Houdini and made it very accessible for um, lots of different uh, levels of, um, of artists, which is great. Okay, so lastly, we're gonna talk about deadline farm submission with, you know, a server and a client machine. So, Deadline is a render farm manager. It is, um, I think it was bought, it, was, it used to be its own thing that was bought by um, AWS uh, and Amazon Web Services. Uh, and so Amazon owns it. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's, it's kind of the standard, if you go to any studio, that's kind of the standard render farm 
um, manager. So, you know, like usually when you log into your machine, you see a deadline window and you got to take your machine off the farm or you're going to, uh, you're going to have a bad day when you're working. Just uh, everything's going to go slow. Um, deadline is very uh, versatile, very easy to set up. Um, and very, uh, when I say very versatile, I just mean a lot of different applications have plugins that can handle it. Um, it used to be a little bit more difficult to set up with earlier versions of Houdini. Houdini 20 um, and onward just has like a very easy automatic setup for it. And it's just like built in. So um, once we learn how to set up top networks to really uh, make the most of our local machine resources, we are going to learn how to set up um, a server and a client uh, machine and farm out all of our uh, task, um, which is, you know, extremely powerful, f powerful if you're an individual artist, but oh my goodness, you can take advantage of so many resources and so much um, power if, if you're at a studio with this too. So um, this is, this is going to be great no matter what type of artist you are. Um, it's, it's kind of been a black box um, to me in, in a lot of my career, but uh, just looking at how um, it works, it's, it's actually quite easy to set up. Uh, and the best thing about it is that it is free for 12 months. Um, and free in quotes, meaning that uh, they will, um, you know, if you have obviously a large team or if you're pumping a lot of data, then you, um, you have to pay for it. But they've got a notification service and a um, kind of a, a governor service on it to where it's like you can set your limit to like zero or one cent and if you go over one cent it'll stop you or it'll send you notifications so even if you want to just try this out um you know same with houdini if you if you don't own houdini and you want to um try this out you can do the apprentice mode in houdini which is free and you can also do a free trial of deadline um everything that we're going to cover is free and uh you know it's great because you can get in here you can understand this you can uh learn it and um you know you can use it for your projects